got these this morning. Sorry. There you go. There you go. Today we're going to be looking at Acts 9. Watch out for the art zone. Markers aren't quite as treacherous as marbles, I don't think, but they're close. And we did find out if you leave one stick in your bed and you forget about it without a cap, it will bleed all over the sheet and then it will get on your shirt and your skin as a semi-permanent tattoo. So it is, it is amazing. Craig, if you need a new tattoo, just or if you want a tattoo crystal, just slip a marker in the bed and you'll be all set. So. Crystal, yes, sudden death, sudden glory. Crystal may feel as though I'm doing this right now, but has your family ever been threatened? Threatened. Not you? Have you ever felt threatened? Yeah? You can call me an overly cautious dad, but I think it was, it was Friday, Thursday or Friday, one of those days, Isaac had, he had gone out without me noticing, he had gone outside without me noticing, and I was talking with someone at my, at my dining room table and uh, our, our back door comes in from the garage, which the, door, the garage door was open, so that did not surprise me, but it comes right into our dining room. And our door begins to open. And I'm thinking to myself, everyone that I'm aware is supposed to be here is here, in my house, and my door is opening. Now fortunately, I, I did I hurriedly got up because I'm like I've just got a few seconds to figure this out and fortunately I did figure out that it was Isaac coming through the door before I slammed the door on whoever was trying to come in <laughs> but I thought if this is just some random person walking into my house I'm at least going to have a bit of a jump on them by slamming their head between the door and the door jam in the event that I need that advantage. Now fortunately, like I said, I mean, Isaac would have been hurting bad at that point in time, so fortunately I did get that stopped. I would have been, I would have experienced that sudden death, sudden glory piece <laughs> later when Teresa got home, so. Well, we get, to, we get to experience a family that's under attack, that family being the, the church the body of Christ at this point in time. Acts 9, we're going to look at 1 to 19 today. We'll see if I can pull that off without knocking it over. Acts 9, 1 to 19. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the, the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked them for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell on the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Excuse me. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind. 
and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him and restore his sight. The Lord, Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with the authority from chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, regained his strength. Paul, I'm sorry, Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Well, that's a fun little passage, huh? Who does Saul think he is? He's kind of like the bug, bug and Levi right now. Before, like as this begins, how, who does who does Saul think he is? The hand of God. How so? That's true. He thinks he is helping the Lord keep things clean and pure and holy in the way that's supposed to be by taking out this group of people and persecuting them to the point that they stop doing what they're doing because it's screwing with his traditions. They're following what the Lord taught them to do. Why is he doing that? That's a good question. Why is he persecuting the disciples? We just, we just heard that answer of, you know, he's, he's messing with the religion, but... He was being obedient to what he had been taught and who he came to believe who he was was from what he was taught by the schools that he went to. Yeah. The group of people who had taught him, who had trained him, had brought him to a place where he saw himself as an instrument of cleansing, per se. It's like, I need, I need to fix this. This is, this is my job. Do you remember Stephen? Stephen was stoned to death, and it is this, the same guy, Saul, giving approval to his death. He's the manager of that that stoning, per se. That's exciting, right? Not really, I'm kidding. Saul is breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. That's fun. Who's, who's had a murderous threat breathed out against them today? Anyone? Not today. Okay, well, that's fair. Who's had a murderous threat ever breathed against them? I mean, some of this may be like legitimate murderous threat or you, were, you feared for your life? Wow. High school gym. Man, that's intense. Like a, a classmate or a teacher or 
older, older girl, older classmate. Man, that's exciting. Who's else, who else's life has ever been knowingly threatened? Not like someone just falling asleep at the wheel and crashing into you type scenario, but like someone threatening to kill you because of something you've done or not done. Anyone? A few students that were pretty upset. Okay, that's fair. Yeah? It's a good thing you're a ninja. <laughs> Saul's going around breathing murderous threats against the disciples. Now, the disciples have already been scattered, right? That's where we're at in this whole ordeal of what's going on with this passage. This this narrative of what's going on in the book of Acts. The, the church has been scattered and it's done something crazy. It's, it's ran those sparks, ran those coals out, and it's creating a wildfire. And Paul's like, or Saul's like, we've got to stop this. We've got to cut, like, this needs to stop. So he's a fire extinguisher per se. He's going out to stop this crap. This ends now. As he is going, another, another time where, not so much about the destination, but in the process, he encounters someone, right? Who's he encounter? Jesus. What, what does this encounter, encounter consist of? What's this look like? He gets knocked off his high horse. It's true. It's true. Suddenly a light from heaven fell around him and he fell to the ground and heard a voice say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now if you're Saul, and you have this encounter, are you, are you inclined to think, this is simply something going on in my head. This isn't really happening. The will of God is that I cleanse, that I squelch this fire, right? I mean, that's kind of like what we were talking about before. Is, is this some, is it even possible for Paul or Saul to think, I keep screwing that up, I'm sorry. Uh, to think that this is just something going on in his head. It could be, except the other people around him hear it as well. But they don't see anyone. So we know that it's audible. We know that this is something that he hears. This is a voice speaking to him. Now if this happens... Hopefully this never happens to any of us, but if something like this, this intense happens to us, how would you respond? Shock, okay, that's, that's reasonable. Okay, you would check yourself into the psych ward, padded room, coloring book, and some crayons? Sounds pretty good to most of us, I think, right? Yeah, I'm in, I'm in. <laughs> What's that? I still can't hear you, David. You wouldn't like the what? Thorazine. Thorazine. Is that, I take it that's some type of drug. Yeah. Awesome. You would take inventory. You, you would like to think you would take inventory. What's this about? What's going on? How did I, like, clearly something is, something's a lie. So what is it? What's going on? That's fair. Who's, who is Saul threatening? Okay. He has permission to drag off anyone and throw them into prison that belongs to the way. Right? What's that? Christians, as they were called. 
Christians. I don't, I don't know that they were called Christians yet, but yeah, it, it, you're fine. I'm not even sure on that. But anyway, they are, they are the disciples of Jesus. They're following Jesus, and we, we will become, be, begin to be called Christians at some point, either already or soon to be. Um, and so this whole encounter is happening, and yet when the Lord speaks to Saul, what does he say? What's that? Well, it's true. That's, Paul, or that's Saul's response to him as he says, why are you persecuting me? And there's a difference there, right? There's got to be a somewhat of a disconnect for Saul at this point in time where he's got permission and is going about persecuting the church. He's per persecuting the disciples of Jesus and then all of a sudden, he encounters Jesus on the road to Damascus. On his way, he encounters the, the Lord. And the Lord says to him, why are you persecuting me? The analytical side of me says, I'd probably respond, Lord, I'm not. I'm not persecuting you. You know, I mean, if you were here, then clearly this would be different because we could have a conversation and I could convince you that you are not the Christ. That's, I think that's what Saul would be thinking. Absolutely. He understood the law and he, he enacted that in his life incredibly well. And he was very proud of it. And he was incredibly proud of it. And he was doing exactly what it takes to advance in the system. Yes, he was advancing well through the system. He, he at this point in time was probably at, at very close to the pinnacle of his career as a Pharisee. It's like, look at me. Look at me. I am, I am really serving the law right now. I am serving our... He is incredibly religious. He is so religious it's ridiculous. His entire life is consumed by what he's doing. Everything he does. Sounds like the Muslims and the police? In the Middle East. In the Middle East. I, yes, the extremist. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you want to know what it is to be these things, look at me. That's what he's. That's what he. That's who he is. That's who he is. When you see someone who embodies everything that you have been pursuing in life, when you encounter that person, that that person in this case being Jesus, who personifies. He embodies all of it. And he comes to you and says, why are you persecuting me? That's a day of reckoning right there. This is a big deal for Saul. This is, this is huge. This is huge. But there is a, there, there's a major distinction that's going on that we need to realize what's, what's happening with it. And that's the distinction of who Paul thought he or who Saul thought he was persecuting and who Jesus tells him he's persecuting. The disciples of Jesus, and then he's told, you are persecuting me. Why? What is going on with that? Why is it that Jesus tells him that he's persecuting him? He is. His body, that's, that's true. It's making it real. You know, Paul, in essence, is going out against the, in his mind, false teaching, false theory, false concept. This is something away from what is true and right. So it was kind of an abstract thing that he was going at. This was not abstract. This is not abstract, yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, that is an incredible, like, whoa. Paul's got a lot, or Saul's got a lot going on in his head, and I'm having a really hard time keeping the two apart right now. He called him by his Hebrew name, Saul, not once, but twice. It's true. It's not quite the same as using a middle name, but I think it's close. Or just... I don't know if they had middle names then. Yeah. There's often two identifiers for the body. Of, I've just given you one. The body of Christ, right, is Christ's body. That's how, that's one connection of why persecuting the disciples is persecuting Christ. It's his body. It's him. It is him. What's another, what's another framework or understanding of who the church is? in relationship to, to Jesus. His bride. The bride of Christ. When, for those of us with a, with a spouse, when something happens to your spouse, do you, if, if something negative happens to your spouse, do you hurt with them? If something happy happens with your spouse are you joyous with them it is as though when something happens to your spouse it's happening to you yes what's that how so oh yeah you're right I I'm with you I don't I can't speak that into everyone's life. I didn't, I didn't know if that was true of everyone, but you, you are much better served. If you're going to hurt either of Teresa or I, especially physically or emotionally, if you're going to hurt either one of us, you, better be, you, you had better probably pick me. Because, what's that? You don't worry, well, that, that may be. Some, some of you may be more afraid of Teresa than me. That's true. I didn't, I didn't think of that. But anyway, I don't want you to be afraid of either of us, quite frankly. But um, I really wrestle when, thing, when people do things to Teresa, it's much harder for me to control my rage, quite frankly, and my, my thought process than if it's done to me. Like, I can handle people doing stupid stuff to me. You don't do stupid stuff to my wife. Like, that's really frustrating. That's really frustrating. Saul is persecuting Jesus. And he's doing so by persecuting Jesus' disciples, his body and his bride. It is, it is him. That's who, he's, that's who he's persecuting. And we get to this question that Saul asks. Who are you, Lord? And I love the response here. I love the response. Because it's incredibly sim simple. I am, which I, I think Jesus uses to identify not only who he is in the present, like He's telling him, I am, yes, I'm, I am Jesus. But I am says what? I am. I am. Where do we hear that? When, when the questions ask, Lord, who, what do I tell them if they ask who you are? I am who I am. Which is incredibly clear, right? It is and it's not. But it is a, an amazing statement of who God is. And Jesus, I believe, not by accident, identifies himself with that. I am, if I were editing this, I would put a comma right there. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city. And what do we see Saul do? Oh, 
he's done persecuting. He tries to open his eyes, finds out he's blind. Now, I've got to believe that he's still, in, even in light of that, I think he was going to be responsive to that. How huge of a statement is this to simply say, I am Jesus, now go. He was persecuting him a moment ago, and now he has become a subject. Boom. That is incredible. It is amazing to look at how fast an enemy of Christ can become a vessel and a part of Christ's work. It is absolutely amazing. But it is the power of our Lord that he can take someone who goes from absolute hatred and an enemy of the word, and an em en enemy, wow, an enemy of Jesus, to being a servant. You're right. So that You're right. Yeah, you're right. His physical blindness probably bothered him much less than the blindness that he was experiencing in life. He had just been blindsided by what was going on, and now he is so unsure, because he was absolutely certain what he was doing before, right? I'm going around, and I'm collecting up these believers that are following Jesus and his disciples, and I'm going to throw them in jail, because that's what they need. They're going to be my trophies. They're going to make me look good, so that I can continue to advance my career. This is going to be awesome. I think he probably inspired the Lego song. Everything is awesome. He probably inspired it. Because that's what he was thinking. I doubt it too. I'm, I'm kidding. But he goes into a responsive mode to what, what Jesus has said. He simply goes into being responsive. Now I got to believe Saul at this point in time to everyone else is still an enemy, right? They don't, they don't understand this encounter. They, they are as, quote, blinded by this encounter as anyone else. They don't know this is happening yet. They don't understand what, what the Lord is up to. And so when verse 7 begins to happen, the men traveling with Saul, Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand to Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. As a disciple of that time, if you were to find out about this, what do you think you're going to do? How are you going to respond? What's that? Really? really? <laughs> this dude was coming for us? Is like, he's out of commission? He's down? Who gets to kick him first? I, I have to believe that if this were to happen, my first reaction when my adversary goes down is a, a bit of like, yes! Right? It's an, I believe, a natural response to have a celebration when there's any sign of victory. Now, while the victory, I don't believe, is identified as the same, it is victorious, yes. But the reason why we are celebrating is probably not as legitimate as why we should be celebrating. But I believe that this probably brought joy. It certainly, as I read through it, I'm like, yes! Go Jesus! Knock this dude off his horse. Like, that's awesome! And he blinded him, and he sent him, and this guy is, he is in serious trouble. It's kind of like the kid in school that everyone's like, oh, you're going to the principal's office. I don't know that's such a big deal anymore. Everyone's like, oh, yeah, again? Okay, here I go. Do you even send people to the principal's office anymore? I don't know. Yeah, they do? Well, good to know. What? 
Wow, that's a lot. That's a lot. Saul is dealing with this situation where he's, he's been blinded, he's down, he's out, and the Lord calls to Ananias. And Ananias is told to go to Saul and to help him out. He is, he's told, go to the house where this guy named Saul is, and he has seen a vision of you coming to him, praying for him, and restoring his sight. Oh, that's what he's told to do. That's so, this, this, again, this moment of like, what is the will of God and how do we discern it? Ananias responds, Lord, I've heard what this guy has done. Are you crazy? That's not exactly how he responds. But Oh my God, like, what is going on? We finally caught a break. He's not going to be able to go and breathe his murderous threats. We've decom he's, he's been decommissioned. He's lost his capacity to do what he said he's going to do. And we have reason to celebrate because now he cannot persecute us as well as he could have before. What in God's name do you want me to go there for and bring back his sight? He's arguing. This past week has been, uh, probably the last two weeks, have been incredibly difficult for me in reference to the struggle of people doing things to Teresa. Her work environment has been stressful in the least. Uh, I would probably describe it as hostile. That's how I, that's how I view it. If people are being hostile toward my wife and I get this rage that begins to bubble up inside of me and just she always uses the phrase run people over with her car and watch her feet wiggle <laughs> I, I I don't know I don't I don't know exactly what I feel I don't even just I can't describe to you what I want to do but I definitely want to do something to these people and it usually involves bodily harm it really does. That's what I feel I want to do. Now, I have not done bodily harm to anyone, just so you all are aware. No reason to call the police. <laughs> Yet, he says. But my response has been this. My response was I bottled it. I internalized the attack that happened to Teresa, I internalized it in my life, the feelings that I was experiencing, the anger that was going on, I internalized it and it began to bubble out. I noticed it bubbling out as my kids would do something that would frustrate me and I would just go off on them. And it was totally unfair to my kids. Totally uncalled for on my part. I'm like, whoa. It was enough that, that I was like, okay, something is going on. And I need to dig into this some. And I was digging into it with a group that I, I meet with. And it was frustrating to have to walk through this, realize it, to, to realize where this was coming from, to realize that I had been bottling everything that had been happening to Teresa. And then the, these words came out of the mouth of, of one of the guys that's, that's in this group. And it's much like what Ananias is, is called to do here. He asked if I was praying for this lady that was causing the most stress for Teresa. And I'm like, I, I want to harm her. Why would I want to pray for her? Of course, the, the piece that comes into that is, well, <laughs> As believers, that's what, that's what we get to do. That's what we're called to do. It's what our response needs to be opposed to going and beating the crap out of someone. 
Now, while the other may give you temporary gratification, it's going to cause more trouble than good. And I noticed immediately, immediately, I, the resentment, the anger began, like I could literally feel it subside in my life. Now, it's not all gone. I'm still wrestling with the fact that Teresa's, quote, being attacked. But I think I had a, a moment where I understood what Ananias was feeling here as he's called to go and pray for Saul. It's like, no, I don't want to go and pray for Saul. I want him to suffer. He killed Stephen. He's persecuting the other believers. He's, called, he's wreaking havoc. I want him to suffer. Ananias is told, go. This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and to show them how much he must suffer for my name. Would the church have been better off without Paul? What do you think? He he caused this he he indirectly affected the spread of Christianity as we know it on both the front side of his career and the back. What's that? The New Testament would, I, it, could be, it could be smaller, or we have a different author. Yeah, God could always raise somebody else up, but in previous records, like, I don't remember, there were individuals who were with the enemy for a season, and then God brought them to where he wanted to bring them, so sure. they could minister to God's people. We're all enemies of God until we come under his authority. That's where we all were. We're all there at some point in our life. Until we come under his authority, we are an enemy of God. <laughs> and I dare say that we all have been in that moment where we have been instrumental in spreading the faith both before and after we encountered the Lord. Because I believe that God uses all things to accomplish his will. But this is, this is a crazy moment where Ananias has to make a decision of, am I going to do what God tells me to do or not? Will I do what is against what I want to do because it accomplishes what God wants to get done? And that's a crazy moment. It's a crazy moment because some, uh, like, like Philip last week, I get to... I have to take a journey on a to a desert road and I'm going to have one encounter with one person to do something. Except that encounter was incredibly fruitful, not on the beginning side of things, but the seed that was planted there went and became a great production of fruit. Ananias, same type of situation. Ananias, I want you to go and pray for for this guy named Saul. He's expecting you. There's a lot of pressure here on Ananias. He's expect, your name was used in the vision that I gave him. He's expecting you to come. Now it's one thing to have the enemy knock on your door, right? It's a whole nother deal to enter into the house of your enemy and say, I have been sent to do this on the Lord's behalf. We 
know this encounter is going on in Saul's life. But if you're hanging around with someone who persecutes people, like that's been your job for a while, and all of a sudden you've got someone that looks like this, that breathes like this, that smells like this, that just shows up, you're going to have this, i got to believe you're going to have the same response I did when Isaac was walking through that door. This guy's a believer. We've been persecuting and jailing believers for a while. Let's do it to him. They've been conditioned to have that as a response. That's what Ananias is going to walk into. He's walking in to enemy territory at this moment in time to accomplish the will of God. So this notion that God only sends us into safe places is a bunch of crap. That the will of God will cause us comfort and peace. While it accomplishes peace, the understanding of what that peace is is much different than non-conflict. God sends him into this situation. And Ananias has to believe that God is going to accomplish his will. He's going to get this done and that even in going into this enemy territory, it's going to be okay. It's going to work out. And he chooses to go and pray for, for Saul. He places his hands. And it's amazing how quickly God can do things in a man's heart. It really is. How long do you have to know someone before you call them your brother? What's that? It does depend. Depends on how much you like the person, how well you identify with them, a number of different things, right? If you can remember their name. But it is Brother Saul. He doesn't call him jerk. He doesn't call you, hey, you, enemy of mine. He identifies him as Brother Saul. Not because of anything that Ananias did, but because Ananias recognized who he was looking at. Because of the encounter that Ananias, that Saul had with Christ, Ananias now saw him not as an enemy, but as family. And this is all happening in a very short amount of time. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, sent me to you so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. It takes an incredible encounter to move someone from a, a, an anger-filled response or a, a, a celebration type or a, a response at someone else's turmoil to be willing to identify them as family, to go and do the work of God and pray for them that they may be whole again. That's incredible. This happens within a few days. This is not a long, drawn-out encounter where they have time to sit over a table and talk through their differences or anything. I mean, this is like, whoa! This is incredible. Ananias goes and does this work. Immediately the scales, something like scales, fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. Now, what, what's up with this baptism piece? What's he get baptized for? He's baptized for the Holy Spirit? Okay. He's baptized because he's a believer. 
He's encountered Christ, and that's what Jesus' disciples do. They follow in his example. Believe and be baptized. And he pursues it. He goes after it. He's in the family. He's, he is part of the family. And it takes some time, as we'll see going through the rest of the book of Acts. It, Ananias is a peculiar guy here. Not everyone buys into this that Saul's changed. Like, no, 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 no. Are you crazy? This is the enemy here. But sometimes, as believers, we get to be advocates of those that we wrestle with. We get to, to stand up on someone else's behalf and say, no, he is part of the family. And that's a crazy moment because sometimes family members do crazy, stupid stuff, don't they? So Ananias' reputation is riding on Saul not being stupid and continuing to be responsive to what the Lord is doing. Now, quite frankly, Ananias had been instructed to do something, right? So if you get instructed to do something, you, you have a choice. There's always a choice, right? It's not a good choice in this time to not do it. And Ananias pursues it. I think it's important for us to realize that there are brothers and sisters who are being attacked around this world. There are people who are going absolutely crazy because of what the disciples of Jesus are doing in this world. And there are enemies who will soon be advocates of Christ. And it is those people who are in the position to make incredible differences for the family of God. Someone that goes from killing Christians to being one is heavily motivated to make a high amount of difference for the work that God is doing in this world. Quite frankly, their life depends on it. Now, they're okay with dying, too. I'm convinced of that. I'm convinced that they are okay with dying for the faith if they're willing to jettison killing Christians for the sake of being one. They're willing to die for that. But we need to be praying, not only for those who are persecuted, but for those who are persecuting. And I know that's difficult to do. It's incredibly difficult to do. It is tough to pray for the people that we would rather see bad things happen to. And that's the other piece of this. <laughs> I think sometimes we want to pray for someone to die. Or we want to, we want to pray harm on someone. And that's not the invitation here either. The invitation is to pray for their good, to pray that they may see the light. And we also get to be that light in this world. It is who we are. We are Jesus' disciples. When, like, like this situation, when Saul would go and persecute the church, he was persecuting Christ. It's what he saw. It's who he was seeing as he was persecuting them was Christ. So as we go, we are viewed by others as Christ. They get a glimpse of who Christ is by looking in through our lives. Are we perfect? Maybe you are. I'm not there yet. But we can, we can be a glimpse enough that Jesus brings them to recognize who he is through the life that he calls us to live. A life that he invites us to call others to follow. So this week I leave you with the, the nice, fun, loving challenge of Pray for our enemies.
pray for those who, who do not seek the same that we seek. Yeah. I thought you were going to say something. No? Okay. Pray for their good. Because as, as uncomfortable as it can be for us, it is what we are called to do. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have called us. We thank you that you have sent us. And we thank you that you have not sent us alone. That you send the Holy Spirit well ahead of us and yet present in our lives as well. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to be responsive to your call, that we'd be willing, even eager, to do your work, even when it involves, even when it involves the enemy, that we may pray, we may pray for their good, that they may come to know you as Lord and Savior. That they would come to recognize and submit to your rule and authority. Lord, we love you. And we thank you for the work that you've done in us to bring us from being your enemies to being your family. We pray that we may go about your work In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's the part where I tell you to have a great week and go and love and serve the Lord. It still stands true, but this one may be a little tougher than most. <laughs>